Good evening Tributes and welcome back to Tales of the Hunger Games. I hope you've all had a nice week and thanks once again for all your comments on the last video and I hope you enjoy this one as well. Before we go on I need to say that there will not be a video next week as that is going to be my week off but the Monday after that which will be 9th of November we will be continuing with the 81st games. I'd also like to give a big thanks to Andrew McLean for all the art that is featured in this series. Please check his link in the pinned comment below. And I'd also like to give a big thanks to my Patreons. Your support is much appreciated. And I'm also going to be doing a Q&A at the end of the next video. So check the end of this video for question details. And if you've got a good question, then leave it as a reply to the pinned comment below. Now without further ado, let's go. In accordance with the Treaty of the Reclamation, every five years a special set of rules would be incorporated into the Hunger Games in a special set of games known as a Quinquennial Quell. These games were used to remind the districts of the capital's continuous command over them. On July the 3rd, President Gaul made a live announcement on Capital TV in which he announced the conditions for the first Quinquennial Quell, which would take place over the coming week. Gaul stated that in order to remind the districts that even their victors were not immune to the power of the capital, this year's tributes would be reaped from the pool of victors' descendants who were aged between 12 and 18. This decision immediately proved to be popular amongst capital citizens, who seemed to know that they were about to see an unforgettable year of the games. There were certain districts that had no male or female descendants of victors between these ages at the time of the games, especially in the outlying districts where there had been less victors. However, President Gaul wisely planned a solution to this problem by stating that the descendants of victors' siblings could also be included in this pool of tributes, which thereby allowed for enough male and female youths to be reaped as tributes from each district. As usual, District 12's reaping was the first to take place, with last year's victor, Maxima Liu, making no effort to hide how much she did not want to have to return to this hobble. To make matters worse, all the potential tributes were from a group known as the Covey, due to their great-aunt, Lucy Greybeard, having won the 10th Hunger Games. This group was known for being rather loud, especially when they were together, and some of them were singing and clapping rhythmical beats when they were supposed to be waiting in silence for the reaping to begin. Eventually, after the peacekeepers finally got this rowdy group to quieten down, Maxima made a brief speech about how she had enjoyed being a victor over the last year before choosing the female tribute. She gave the girls a rather icy stare as she picked out a paper, before revealing that she had chosen 17-year-old Cure Olive Lip. Cure sighed out and was patted on the arm by her fellow youths, but she confidently marched to the stage in a fluffy teal dress, which brushed past the peacekeepers as Cure walked past them. It was also noted that several of the peacekeepers were looking suspiciously at Cure's blue bobcut and trying to figure out how she had gathered the resources to dye her hair this colour. She stood surprisingly calmly in front of the crowd as Maxima was about to announce the male tribute. Cure, who made most of her living by singing to crowds in the inns and taverns of the district, seemed very tempted to grab the microphone from Maxima, but she luckily seemed to restrain herself. Maxima then picked out the name of the male tribute, who was revealed to be Remedio Burgundy Cartwright, the cousin of Cure Olive Lip. Remedio was clearly a member of the Covey, judging by his matching sapphire waistcoat and trousers, along with his thick black dreadlocks that were finely decorated with light blue flowers. Remedio naturally seemed rather forlorn about being chosen, possibly due to it having been his 19th birthday in the next month, but he still made his way to the platform as his dreadlocks swayed around behind him. He shook hands with Maxima, and instead of shaking hands with Cure, he embraced her, which made Maxima roll her eyes, and Cure finally let out some tears. Maxima dismissed the remaining youths, before leading Remedio and Cure into the town hall, and without saying another word to them, she quickly made her way to the train for the next reaping in District 11. Remedio Burgundy and Cure Olive were soon escorted onto the train from District 12 station, and even before they had finished admiring the fine decorations and riches that were present within the main carriage, the train was setting off for the capital. The pair quickly helped themselves to the food that had been provided, and they seemed too distracted to notice that their mentor, Gail Hawthorne, had entered the carriage behind them. According to the guard that was present at the time, Gale's face was a picture of bewilderment as he looked at his tributes for this year. Although Gale had lived in District 2 prior to the reclamation, he returned to District 12 after the 76th Hunger Games in order to be the guardian to Crimson and Rue Malark after their parents' passing. 
Due to his experiences with hunting and fighting within the Second Rebellion, Gale had also been suggested for the role of mentor to this district, which he had been for the last four games. Shortly after meeting Remedio and Cure, Gale appeared somewhat annoyed by the fact that they were singing and bashing their hands on the mahogany table in order to make music, when he clearly wanted to talk to them about the upcoming games. Cure stated that neither of them had ever been hunting in their lives, and that their best chance of winning was to entertain the crowds and get gifts from sponsors. As they continued making this wretched noise, Gale pointed out that there was no guarantee that they would have received any gift, especially if they died in the bloodbath, and that these gifts could include weapons, so it was important for them to know how to fight with a weapon if they were lucky enough to get one. Although Cure began to sing once again, Remedio appeared to take heed of what Gale was saying, and he asked Gale what he would use in this carriage to kill someone. When Gale quickly gave several detailed answers involving a variety of implements, Remedio seemed more engaged, and he told Cure to stop singing so that he could hear. For the rest of that day, Gale spoke to the pair about what weapons were most effective in the arena, but he then spoke about the upcoming week, and how they could possibly use their showmanship to their advantage in order to appease sponsors. The remaining reapings occurred as normal, with some more unpopular choices of tributes being made to represent their districts, but these tributes had to accept their roles nonetheless. The reaping for District 4 took place the next afternoon, with Maxima still looking full of energy, despite the arduous travels and trials that she had had to go through that day. Of the three girls who were eligible for the role of tribute from District 4, Maxima chose 16-year-old Adelaide McCain, the great-granddaughter of Farrell McCain, who won the 27th Hunger Games. She cried a little as she heard her name, and seemed reluctant to walk up to the platform. Eventually, the peacekeepers that were present had to take Adelaide by the arm and practically force her onto the stage, which made her cry even more. The only boy who was eligible to be chosen was Finnick Jr. O'Dare, the son of Finnick O'Dare, the winner of the 65th Hunger Games. Finnick Jr. was known for his infectious smile and bright curly red hair, the former of which he was still showing as he stood in the male reaping enclosure, despite the fact that as the only boy standing there, his fate was already sealed. As Maxima walked over to the bowl containing the male tribute's names, Finnick walked to the stage, which led Maxima to shout at him to stay where he was. He rather arrogantly told her that everyone knew that he would be chosen, and that they may as well get on with it, which caused laughter throughout the crowd. Whilst Maxima glared at Finnick, a peacekeeper came over and stood directly behind him. Maxima then picked up the paper and read out Finnick's name. He pretended to act surprised, and asked if Maxima was sure that she had read the paper correctly, but Maxima was not amused. Eventually, Finnick was escorted to the platform, and before even having a chance to shake his hand, Maxima stormed off the stage and back into the town hall. Finnick Jr. and Adelaide were quickly placed on the train to the capital, and before they could even sit down, their mentor, Annie Crester, rushed into the carriage in a flood of tears and embraced Finnick. He quickly told Annie not to cry, and she informed him that his father would have been so proud of him for his bravery during the reaping. Finnick then introduced his mother to Adelaide, and the train set off. Annie started talking to Adelaide and Finnick about the upcoming week, but within a few minutes, Adelaide left the carriage and according to a guard, she was sat rather moodily in the corridor. Finnick came and spoke to Adelaide, and before he could finish asking her what was wrong, she stated that Annie obviously did not want her to win, as she was not Annie's child. However, Finnick told Adelaide that they needed to be each other's allies, and that although she may be correct to some degree, Annie would do everything that she could to help Adelaide be a strong fighter, so that she could protect him as well as herself. This talk seemed to alleviate Adelaide's mood, and she returned to the carriage, where Annie briefed them on how they should interact with the careers. She reminded them to seem as confident as possible throughout the training and not show their fear. Yet before the sun had even set, Annie seemed tired, and so she retired to her carriage. For the rest of the evening, Finnick and Adelaide looked out of the window at the passing light, and they spoke about how their lives might be different if they managed to return to District 4. The next day, the hotly anticipated parade took place in the Avenue of the Tributes. Remedio Burgundy and Cure Olive spent the first part of the day being groomed for the parade by their stylist, Aisha Monti. However, neither Remedio nor Cure were pleased with Aisha's idea to dress them as a doctor and a nurse, and when Remedio refused to let Aisha cut his dreadlocks, she walked out of the stylist's quarters, allegedly saying that she no longer cared what the pair looked like, but they could work on their own clothes. Meanwhile, Cormac Plinth, who had never designed for District 4 before this year, 
decided to cover Finnick Jr. and Adelaide in various colours of seaweed and blue body paint all over, with only a few sparkling shells covering the important areas. Whilst Finnick allegedly did not mind this outfit, Adelaide was rather mortified to be covered in these materials and even cried shortly before the parade in an effort to convince Cormac to change these outfits, but with no success. However, once their chariot started down the parade, Finnick quickly appeared to convince Adelaide to make a good impression, and they both waved to the cheering crowd. A few electric sparks flew from the outfit of Pixel Plumber from Three, who was just in front of Finnick and Adelaide, which not only scared Adelaide, but also the horse that was pulling their carriage. Yet Finnick continued to grab Adelaide's hand while stroking the horse. Despite a few cautious sounds from the audience, who appeared to notice that the District 4 tributes might be in trouble, Finnick proved himself capable of calmly keeping things together, with Caesar Flickerman, who had been invited back to commentate on this year's quell, mentioning that in this respect, Finnick was just like his mother. There was also some more chaos further down the parade, when Dylan Mitchell from Eleven had pulled on Remedio Burgundy's dreadlocks shortly before they mounted their courages. Remedio punched Dylan in the face, and they were quickly pulled apart by the peacekeepers. Although Dylan's nose was bleeding during the parade, he covered it up with a leaf from his outfit. Behind Dylan's carriage was that of Remedio and Cure, who had appeared to dress themselves as surgical doctors, with teal hairnets, face masks and aprons that were traditionally used during operations that took place in the district. At first, these outfits mustered a groan from the audience, some of whom allegedly stated that the pair had clearly made no effort. But when they were halfway down the parade, they suddenly ripped off their hairnets to reveal Remedio's dreadlocks and Cure's jet black curls which were covered in fascinators of a range of blue colours. As the audience suddenly started to pay attention to this pair, they pulled off their face masks to show that they were both wearing teal lipstick. They finally ripped off each other's aprons to reveal puffy tulle outfits in a variety of bright blue colours before joining their hands together and raising them into the air. These further reveals gathered mass applause from the audience, with Eugenia immediately stating that she would wear either of these outfits and Caesar jokingly agreeing. The pair were subsequently voted as best dressed by Anderson Fashion, which allegedly made Aisha Monty furious. The training began the next day, and for this special year, the mentors were allowed to watch their tributes from the assessor's box. Allegedly, B.T. Latir, Annie Cresta, Michelle Onassis, and Gail Hawthorne socialised together, and they spent most of this time discussing their tribute strengths and weaknesses together. Charmer Bocelli and Chiffon Malone, both from one, worked alongside Rusius Galloway and Herminia Monto, both from two. The quartet seemed to seize any opportunity that they could in order to intimidate the other tributes. They also practiced fighting together in order to improve their own skills whilst assessing each other's. During the first day, Herminia tried to befriend Remedio and Cure as she had mentioned to the other career tributes that it would be good to have at least one of the more medical tributes on their side in case they received injuries within the arena. However, Cure quickly pointed out to Herminia that she had heard the negative comments that Herminia and the other careers had been making about their parade outfits, and so she was not interested in this alliance with them. Finnick Jr. watched this altercation between Cure and Herminia, and he seemed rather impressed by Cure's bravery to stand up to one of the careers like this. As Herminia rather angrily marched back to her fellow careers, Finnick saw Annie and Gail standing together and discussing what had just happened. He therefore introduced himself to Cure and Remedio, and they instantly seemed to build a strong rapport with each other. Finnick showed them how to use a trident, whilst they demonstrated the best way to sew up a wound that could be created by this weapon. Meanwhile, Adelaide seemed rather out of her element in the training station. She walked between various stations and observed other tributes without participating. However, towards the end of the first day, she looked over to see Pixel Plumber, who was crying in a corner by the electric station. Although Adelaide at first looked like she wanted to ignore Pixel, she eventually walked over and asked her what was wrong. Pixel stated that she missed her son, Button, who was only six months old. Adelaide spoke to Pixel and asked her about Button. Although this appeared to upset Pixel at first, it gradually seemed to lighten her mood, and after Adelaide told Pixel a little about what she was worried about as well, Pixel appeared to be reassured to some degree. Apple Goldstein, from 3, came over to tell Pixel and Adelaide that he had managed to rewire an electrical circuit to create a rather crude picture from its lights, which he showed to the girls, and it made Pixel laugh, although Adelaide tried to hide her amusement. The next day, Cure and Remedio practiced with the swords and spears, although they quickly seemed to find this difficult, and so they spied on Polly Berwick from 8, 
in the material station and try to understand how she was able to stitch clothes together so quickly from the different fabrics. Adelaide practiced archery with Pixel and Apple before showing them how to tie a net and create a basket from sticks, whilst Finnick went to the survival station and met Bradford Farnham and Joe Casta Ramon, both from 10. They allowed Finnick to watch them as they tried to make a shelter within a bush from the branches that were provided. Although Jocasta had never been able to speak, she signed to Bradford how attractive she thought Finnick was, which made Bradford jokingly throw a twig at her before telling her to focus, however this only made Jocasta laugh further. The next day, the assessment of training scores took place. Finnick Jr. showed his best skills with the Trident, and he was pleased to be the joint highest scorer with a score of 10, which was also received by Charmer and Rucius. Adelaide, on the other hand, used a variety of water-based skills in order to receive a score of 7, whilst Remedio and Cure allegedly created wounds upon the dummies before using various resources to stitch these wounds back together, which left them both with a score of 6. At the bottom end of the scale, Pixel, Hans Ministron from 8, Broder Bernhardt from 9, and Kala Prime from 11 each scored just a 4, although this was the highest bottom score that there had been for some time. For this year's special interview, both Eugenia Ravenstill and Caesar Flickerman interviewed the tributes together, and some of the tributes seemed rather intimidated about having to deal with two interviewers instead of one. After the career tributes interviews went by relatively successfully, Apple appeared almost lost for words and clearly struggled with the two interviewers. Pixel managed her interview slightly better, although she started crying when she spoke about Button, and had to be comforted by Caesar, who told her that she would be able to see her baby again if she won. Finnick Jr. made a very strong impression with the crowd, and Caesar stated that he felt like he was interviewing his father all over again. Eugenia asked if there would be a special girl that Finnick would be returning to if he won, but he rather elusively avoided the question with a grin, amidst wolf whistling from the audience. Unlike Finnick, Adelaide kept herself very composed, but she did not manage to generate much interest in her skills or background, and she therefore failed to make much of an impression with the audience. Bradford spoke about how he was able to go for days without sleep, and that this could help him within the games, although his claims have since been disputed by those who knew him. Following Bradford was Joe Castor, who signed through her interview and had an interpreter that spoke for her. Eugenia asked Joe Castor if she thought that her own ability to talk would affect her in the games, but she quickly replied that it had not affected her ability to do anything in her life so far, so why would it affect her now? This response garnered cheers from the audience, and Caesar said that he thought she might be the dark horse for the win this year. The final tributes were Remedio Burgundy and Cure Olive. Despite being interviewed separately, their interviews took rather similar formats, with them both bursting into song halfway through. Despite the audience clearly enjoying these performances, Caesar had to quickly, yet comically, remind them that if the other tributes were not allowed to perform, then neither were they. However, the pair certainly succeeded in continuing the levels of interest that the capital had invested in them since the parade. Game Maker Paddock's interview was the last to take place, and she started by announcing that this would be her last year as the Game Maker. Although this announcement mustered sorrowful sighs from the audience, Paddock reminded them that she would be going out in style, and that she thought the arena was going to be very appropriate for this year's quell. The next day, the tributes were led to their waiting rooms beneath the arena, where they were dressed in the thin black and grey bodysuits made of light material. The mentors gave their final pieces of advice and best wishes before the tributes entered their tubes and rose into the arena. This year's games took place in an arena known as the Clockface of Doom. As the arena came into focus, many capital citizens in Snow Square gasped with joyous nostalgia. Eugenia announced that this was the first time since the days of the amphitheatre that an arena had been reused, and Caesar mentioned that many people might remember this arena from when it was used for the third quarter quell. Eugenia responded that it was indeed extremely appropriate to reuse this arena, given this year's quell conditions, and that the capital had been robbed of the full use of this arena during the quells 17 years ago. This arena was one of the smallest in the history of the Hunger Games. The cornucopia stood in the centre of the arena, which was a large and perfectly circular lake. The podiums were positioned in the outer half of this lake, whilst the cornucopia itself sat on a small jagged island in the central area of this lake. Rocky spokes protruded out from the central island to the shore at the edge of the lake, marking the boundaries through the jungle beyond. 
Each of these sectors of jungle contained a different hazard that would be activated for one hour over a 12 hour cycle from the start of the second day. For the first sector that was activated at midnight and heading clockwise around the arena, the sectors were as follows. Lightning bolts in 12, blood rainfall in 1, corrosive fog in 2, violent baboons in 3, mocking jabberjays in 4, a deadly freeze in 5, the monster mutt in 6, a paralysis gas leak in 7, bothersome mosquitoes in 8, ferocious lions in 9, a sudden tsunami in 10, and sneaky crabs in 11. As the tributes waited for the countdown, some looked at the jungle behind them, whilst most looked straight forwards at the Cornucopia Island, and a few even seemed to realise from this distance that the only supplies on the island were weapons, and that there was in fact no food or water there. Phoenix Jr. from 4 was placed between Rucius from 2 and Pixel from 3, with his back to Sector 12. He appeared pleased that they were surrounded by water, which would give him an advantage due to his strong swimming skills. Finnick also seemed to spot a trident that was placed directly in front of him on the Cornucopia Island, and this once again made him smile. However, he heard Pixel appearing to have trouble breathing, and seeing that she was friends with his district partner, Adelaide, he nodded to her and mouthed at her to run to the jungle behind them. Adelaide, from 4, was placed just a few positions to the left of Finnick, with her back to Sector 1. She too appeared pleased to see water, but she breathed slowly and seemed to try and focus. Apple from 3 and Jocasta from 10 were stood on adjacent podiums on the other side of the cornucopia, with their backs to sectors 7 and 8 respectively. Although they both seemed worried, they found themselves making eye contact, and given that they had already made friends with each other's friends, Jocasta pointed to Apple and signed Allies, which he appeared to understand as he nodded. The podium of Remedio Burgundy from 12 lay in front of sector 9. He looked around to see Cure Olive from 12, standing a few podiums to his left, with her back to Sector 10. Although Cure appeared to be as scared as many of the other tributes, Remedio smiled and mouthed at her to breathe, which she appeared to do just as the countdown started. This countdown was only 10 seconds long, which appeared to surprise the tributes and even Eugenia, who quickly pretended to get herself ready for the games, and almost as soon as she and Caesar had finished enticing the crowd, the gong sounded. Link Larsen and Veronica von Altgott, both from 5, Broder Bernhardt from 9 and Kala Prime from 11 all immediately dived or jumped off their podiums in the direction of the jungle behind them, albeit at various speeds, with Veronica being the first to make it to the jungle, which he subsequently sprinted through. Meanwhile, the vast majority of the other 20 tributes dove into the water in the direction of the spokes, which they could use to run to the cornucopia, with some of the more aquatically challenged tributes bombing off their podiums and feebly splashing towards the spokes. Finnick tore through the water, and was the first tribute to reach a spoke, which also helped him to be the first to reach the Cornucopia Island. Adelaide managed to mount the adjacent spoke shortly after Finnick, however just as she stood up and started running, Splinter Jordan from Seven grabbed onto her leg, which caused Adelaide to fall onto the spoke and rather painfully graze her head, before sliding into the water. Splinter mounted the spoke and ran along it towards the Cornucopia as Adelaide looked on. Finnick quickly grabbed the trident and looked at other weapons around him that he could take. However, he seemingly failed to notice that Splinter had also reached the island and grabbed an axe, whilst now looking at Finnick with a determined grin. Although the chaos was just beginning around them, Adelaide screamed Finnick's name loudly enough for him to turn around, just as Splinter swiped her axe at him. Finnick jumped back and was only minorly cut on the arm by Splinter's axe, but he proceeded to launch his trident through the air and it hit Splinter through the chest, which sent her to her knees. Finnick suddenly heard shouting coming from round the corner of the island, and as he grabbed the trident from Splinter's chest, he looked around to see Rucius from two, continually stabbing Polly from eight against the rock. As other tributes were making their way to his position along adjacent spokes, Finnick grabbed a nearby spear, before running with both weapons along the spoke that Adelaide had just mounted. She and Finnick then ran towards the jungle of Sector 1, where they could just about see Pixel and Bradford from ten, beckoning to them from within the trees. Meanwhile, on the other side of the cornucopia, Apple and Jocasta had both dived straight into the water, and they quickly mounted their nearest spokes as quickly as they could. However, when Apple almost reached the island, Herminia from two, who had already grabbed a spear from the other side of the island, came running around the side of the cornucopia to see Rusha stabbing Polly. Yet Herminia then looked up and saw Apple just a few metres away, and so she threw her spear at him. Before Apple could properly turn around, the spear hit him through the chest 
and he fell backwards into the water, which led to him drowning within a minute of this injury. Jocasta had been so intent on reaching the island that she did not even notice that Apple had been hit. Although she made it safely to the island and even managed to grab a sword, Charmer, from one, quickly appeared around the corner of the cornucopia, and just as Jocasta appeared ready to run from Charmer, he shot an arrow at her head and she collapsed to the ground, before Charmer took the spear from her hands and got ready to defend the island. During this time, Remedio Burgundy and Cure Olive had both dived into the water when the gong sounded, and they swam surprisingly quickly. Although the tributes of District 12 were traditionally poor swimmers, it later emerged that they had often snuck out of their district illegally and swam in a nearby lake. They both made it onto adjacent spokes relatively quickly, although just as Cure began running, she failed to notice that Sycamore Jordan, from Seven, who had been on the podium next to her, had mounted the spoke as well and was chasing up quickly behind her. Sycamore then proceeded to tackle Cure onto the spoke, and she screamed as she fell against the rock. Although Remedio had been intent on reaching the cornucopia, he looked aghast as he saw Cure being attacked by Sycamore. Furthermore, when Remedio noticed that Polly was being stabbed by Rucius in the area where he would reach the island, he quickly dove to his left, across the water, and towards where Sycamore was now trying to strangle Cure. Cure appeared to be trying to push Sycamore away, but he continued pushing her head into the rock. Yet when Remedio was within metres of them, Cure quickly pushed her knee into Sycamore's groin, and although he shouted in pain, he remained on the spoke and looked at Cure in an extremely vengeful manner. Cure was trying to scurry backwards from Sycamore, but Remedio finally reached the spoke, and as Sycamore ran towards Cure, Remedio grabbed Sycamore's leg, which made him fall against the rock and then into the water. Cure, who seemed extremely relieved to have just been saved by Remedio, noticed that the central island was too chaotic and not worth approaching. She saw Jocasta being stabbed by Charmer, but then looked beyond and saw Finnick and Adelaide running along the spoke towards the jungle of Sector 1. Cure grabbed Remedio's hand and led him across the spoke to the shore of Sector 9. They ran around the beach into Sector 1, just as Finnick and Adelaide reached Pixel and Brafford in the jungle. The quartet were about to head off, but Finnick saw Cure and Remedio approaching them, and he told the others to wait, which they proceeded to do. Once Cure and Remedio caught up with them, all six of the group ran as quickly as they could through the jungle. The group continued through Sector 1, with Finnick and Brafford chopping the undergrowth with the trident and spear, and hence leading the way. The heat started to become rather intense, and Finnick found himself cutting through his top, with Cure jokingly calling him a show-off. They travelled for almost an hour, by which time Remedio's dreadlocks had started dripping. Adelaide then insisted that they take a break and rest for a while. The group proceeded to do so, and they reviewed what had already happened and who they had seen die earlier. Pixel cried when she heard that Apple had been killed, whilst Brafford also appeared forlorn that Jocasta had died. During this conversation, Remedio noticed that Pixel was staring intently through the sky. Remedio asked Pixel what she was looking at, and she claimed that she could see the curve of the force field not far ahead of them. Phoenix stated that the arena would have to be much bigger than this, and that she may be mistaken. As the group looked at this spot on the perimeter and surveyed the surrounding area, Adelaide confirmed that Pixel was right. This surprised the group, and Brafford argued that the arena could not be this small. Pixel grinned and told him that he could keep running towards the force field and maybe find out, but at this point he accepted what Pixel had theorised, and she stated that when it got darker, they would see the perimeter more clearly. Adelaide mentioned that maybe they should continue to travel further from wherever the careers may be, but Cure looked around the small clearing that they had just stopped in, and she claimed that if they took turns keeping watch, this area could be rather secure. They therefore rested and took turns keeping watch over the surrounding paths for the next few hours. Adelaide mentioned that if there was no food or water in the cornucopia, then surely there should be some in the jungle. She asked if anyone would be willing to hunt with her in order to find some food or water, but just as the others were trying to come up with excuses to not leave the clearing, the ringing of descending sponsor gifts was heard. Pixel received some matches, and Finnick and Adelaide were gifted with a spile. After seeing an attached note that said, Drink up, from A, they realised that this device could be used to extract water from the inside of various trees. As Adelaide instantly started using the spile, two large loaves of bread were sent down for Brafford, and minutes later, Finnick did describe the amount of fruit that arrived for Remedio and Cure as being a small orchard. Although a cannon sounded shortly after the group received these sponsor gifts, they seemed to ignore it, as they were rather elated by what they had received, and they soon agreed to share these gifts with each other. Pixel proceeded to start a fire, and as the sun set, they continued to keep watch, 
while sharing stories of their home districts and lives before the games. When it became darker, Pixel was proved to be correct, as the boundary was clearly visible, approximately 200 metres from their location. Later that evening, Remedio, Cure, Finnick and Bradford started to sleep, with Pixel and Adelaide keeping the first watch. At midnight, the portraits of Apple Goldstein from 3, Sycamore Jordan and Splinter Jordan, both from 7, Hans Ministran and Polly Berwick, both from 8, and Jocasta Ramon from 10, were shown in the sky. Six tributes were dead, which was less than the eight who had died on the first day when this arena had been used before. This therefore meant that there were still 18 tributes remaining. A tear dropped from Pixel's eye as she saw Apple amongst the fallen tributes. Adelaide went to put her hand over Pixel's shoulder, but just as she touched her, they jumped at the sudden sound of a lightning bolt coming from their right in Sector 12. This woke up the others in the group and Bradford, who had only closed his eyes a few minutes before, asked what was happening. Pixel replied that she did not know, but the lightning started to become louder and more frequent. Finnick and Remedio stood up for a better view, and as they looked through the night sky, Cure played with the Remedio's dreadlocks and joked that he would need to be careful of the lightning. Remedio playfully rolled his eyes, but Finnick asked why the lightning and rain was only hitting this other area and not them. After a few more minutes of hearing lightning and rain drumming onto the adjacent sector, the group had fully awoken and seemed wary of their surroundings. But when they started to hear screams coming from the sector as well, Finnick and Bradford quickly took the weapons from Pixel and Adelaide. The boys held them at the ready, whilst Pixel looked ready to run, but they then heard a loud scream, followed by a cannon. It was being shown to viewers at this time that a tree in Sector 12 had just been struck by lightning, and fell with such force upon Kala Prime from Eleven that she had been killed from the impact. Dylan Mitchell from Eleven, who had been with Kala since the start of the games, appeared to want to help her, but upon hearing her cannon, he continued sprinting onwards. Yet within a few seconds of running, he entered a large puddle that was hit by lightning, and he was hence electrocuted to death. Within seconds, Dylan's cannon sounded, and the drunken shouts and cheers of capital citizens raged through Snow Square, amidst the traditional opening night parties of the games. Caesar announced that he was shocked by what he had just seen, to which Eugenia replied that he was clearly not as shocked as Dylan and Calla. After these two cannons, the lightning and rain started to calm down to some degree, and Finnick, Cure, and Remedio started to sleep again, although Bradford stated that he was happy to stay awake and keep watch with Pixel and Adelaide. Over the next 30 minutes, the group situation appeared to return to normal, but just as Pixel and Adelaide mentioned that it was Bradford and Remedio's turn to take over, Bradford mentioned that it had appeared to be raining. Adelaide said that she had also just felt some rain on her head, but when Pixel suddenly shouted that she was bleeding, Finnick, Cure and Remedio started to wake up and within seconds, most of this group were shouting when they realised that blood rain was quickly falling down upon them. They quickly grabbed their supplies and Remedio, who appeared to be leading the way, found himself running east towards Sector 2, as he practically dragged Cure by the arm and led the way for Pixel. However, Finnick and Bradford quickly slipped in the wet mud as they got up and due to the blood that was falling onto them from above, they were having trouble seeing properly. Adelaide had started running behind Pixel, but when she saw that Finnick and Bradford were in trouble and struggling to get back up, she ran back to try and help them. She managed to help Finnick to his feet, but just as Bradford tried getting up and stumbled on his back once more, a wave of blood entered his mouth and he started choking. Adelaide tried to pick him up as well, but due to his large muscular frame, this was clearly rather difficult for her. She then screamed as more blood hit her face, and as she looked at Bradford, who was still choking on his back, she appeared to realise that she could not save him. Adelaide therefore grabbed Finnick, who was struggling to see clearly, by his arm, and ran with him beneath the trees after the others from their group. As Bradford's cannon sounded, Adelaide and Finnick caught up with Remedio, Cure and Pixel. After several minutes of running whilst almost blind, the latter trio finally made it to Sector 2. As Cure and Pixel shook in horror at the blood that covered their bodies, Remedio asked them whose cannon had sounded but when Adelaide and Finnick caught up with them just moments later, they realised that it must have been Bradford. They spent the next hour using the spile to access water, which they drank and poured onto their faces in order to cleanse themselves of the blood that was now drying. Finnick was panicking as he found it difficult to open his eyes as Sir Remedio offered to look at them. He stated to Finnick that he would need to stop blinking in order to let them clear themselves, and after Remedio's futile efforts to convince Finnick to keep his eyes open, Cure marched over and held Finnick's eyes open with her fingers. 
Finnick found himself with no other option than to look Cure in her eyes as the thick red substance started to pour away from his eyes. He asked Cure if she was named Olive after the colour of her eyes, and he quickly stated that he thought they were rather beautiful. Cure grinned and stated that the Covey had colours as middle names, and Finnick asked what his would be. Cure pensively looked into Finnick's eyes that were now almost clear, before saying that he would be either blue to match his district colours, or red to match his hair. Yet just as Finnick appeared to be choosing between these options, Adelaide asked why there was a cloud coming towards them from the direction of the perimeter. The crowds in Snow Square started shouting at the group to run, in scenes that were reminiscent to how people had reacted to this mist 17 years before. Cure slowly walked towards this mist, but Finnick grabbed her arm with one hand and his trident in the other, before pulling her away from the mist that was now just metres from their position. Finnick then started running away with Cure, and Pixel, Adelaide and Remedio also grabbed their supplies, then ran ahead of Cure and Finnick. The shouting in Snow Square continued as the group quickly navigated their way through the thick trees and ravines of this sector. At one point, Cure and Finnick took a wrong turn and had to change their direction, which led them to run into the mist as they ran back. Cure shouted in pain as boils appeared on her back, but Finnick, who had also been affected, continued dragging her onwards after the others. They continued shouting directions to each other as they ran, and after a few minutes, they all finally made it to the shore, without any further injuries. In fact, Finnick and Cure ran so quickly from the mist that when they exited the jungle, they ran straight into the water without being able to stop themselves. The pair quickly realised that the mixture of the water with the corrosive substances upon their skin was rather painful, but Cure showed Finnick that it helped clear the boils from her skin. They continued to submerge themselves in the water, and their skin was soon healed. But just as they were about to leave the water, they suddenly heard Adelaide scream and her cannon sounded. Finnick quickly raised his trident, and through the dark, they saw that the career pack had come out of the trees of Sector 1, and were now shooting arrows in their direction. Pixel screamed and ran down the beach to Sector 4, whilst Remedio readied his spear at Herminia and Rucius, who had just come out of the trees and were running up the beach towards Remedio. Pixel screamed at Remedio to run, but as he dodged an arrow from Rucius, Herminia continued towards him with the spear, seemingly unable to see through the darkness that she had just run past Finnick and Cure, who were still in the water. Rucius was reloading his bow as Herminia jabbed Remedio with her spear, although luckily for him, this only produced a minor flesh wound. Yet just as Remedio defended himself with his own spear, Finnick ran out of the water straight towards Herminia. Rucius shouted at Herminia and he shot an arrow at Finnick, but Finnick ducked and proceeded to thrust his trident into the back of Herminia's head, which sounded her cannon before she had even hit the ground. Finnick then turned to face Rucius, who appeared to realise that he was now outnumbered, and rapidly fled towards the jungle. Although Finnick looked tempted to follow Rucius, Remedio and Cure shouted at him to stay. Finnick then looked at Adelaide's body and appeared sad that his district partner had died. He apologised to her, and Cure and Remedio dragged him away to Sector 4, where Pixel was now hiding just as the hovercraft came in to collect the bodies of Adelaide and Herminia. For the next two hours, Cure tended to Remedio and Finnick's wounds, whilst Pixel collapsed in exhaustion. After sleeping for a while, Cure and Remedio mentioned to Finnick that they would like to wash the dried blood from their bodies, and so as he kept watch, they proceeded to leave the jungle and enter the water. Yet just as the pair were washing the blood from their hair, they suddenly looked at each other in shock as they heard a baby crying from the jungle. Finnick also looked around in confusion, but Pixel quickly awoke and screamed out for Button. Finnick quickly tried to grab Pixel as she jumped up, but she kicked Finnick away from her and continued to run towards the sound of the crying. Finnick then chased Pixel, who was frantically screaming Button's name. He was just about to catch her, when he suddenly heard his mother's voice calling for him. Unbeknownst to Finnick and Pixel, the Jabberjays had been programmed to copy the voices of their loved ones, with Annie's voice being reused from the games that had previously occurred in this arena, in order to trap Finnick Jr.'s father. Finnick shouted out for his mother, as Pixel shouted out for Button, but he then appeared to realise that the sound was coming from a nearby bird that was indeed a Jabberjay. Although Finnick tried to reassure Pixel that her baby was not actually in the jungle, she was in too much of a frenzy to listen properly, and she sprinted off through the jungle when she heard the crying become even louder. Finnick tried to follow Pixel, but he was hit in the face by one of the birds, and lost track of Pixel in the darkness. He ran back to the edge of the jungle, but collided with an invisible barrier, which was designed to contain the tributes within the sector. Cure and Remedio then saw Finnick inside the sector, but they were unable to enter the jungle due to the unbreakable barrier. 
After almost an hour of the Jabberjay's sounds, the hazard ended, and Kyur and Remedio tried to lead Finnick out of the jungle. Although Finnick was clearly in a state of shock from his experience over the last hour, he started to reanimate, and stated that they needed to find Pixel. He proceeded to run through the jungle, and Kyur and Remedio immediately ran after him. Yet due to Finnick's disorientation from the Jabberjays, he ran at a different angle, and instead of heading further into Sector 4, he ran straight towards Sector 5. Finnick unknowingly entered Sector 5, and Kyur and Remedio, who seemed a bit worried about shouting too loudly, continued to chase after him. Yet when they caught up with Finnick, he stated that it was becoming rather cold, and he quickly tried to cover his bare skin, whilst Kyur and Remedio also appeared to notice the low temperature. Finnick sprinted off again in search of Pixel, and Kyur shouted at him to stop and wait for her and Remedio. She then said that Pixel might now be on the beach, and so they should wait for her there. Finnick, who was now starting to shiver, agreed. They began to walk backwards, but Kyur noticed that one of the small legs behind them had suddenly frozen over, and the surrounding plants were also turning a frosty white. This in turn made Kyur stand still in tense thought, just as the boys also appeared to observe that the ice was making its way towards them. Finnick shouted that they needed to run, but as the trio started towards the beach, Kyur and Finnick apparently failed to notice Remedio tripping on a branch and falling over. Without even letting out a sound, his body suddenly began to freeze against the floor, and as he tried to move his arms, the frost spread all over his body and froze his limbs completely still. Remedio was subsequently unable to move, except for his eyes, which were manically moving around in their sockets. Even his dreadlocks, that now had real icicles forming all over them, had frozen against the ground. Kyur and Finnick almost made it back to the beach, but they too were caught by the invisible wave of frost, with Finnick tripping and falling to the ground, which froze his hands against the earth, whilst Kyur remained upright and was frozen in a running position, with only her eyes darting around in a frenzy. The crowds in Snow Square murmured in confusion at what had just happened, and there were many people asking if the trio were dead, while other viewers correctly stated that no cannons had sounded. As no other real action was happening in the arena at the time, the cameras switched to the studios, and Caesar quickly interviewed game maker Paddock in order to shed some light on this situation for viewers. Paddock informed the audience that these tributes had fallen foul of the deadly freeze, which meant that although they were alive and their vitals were working fine, they were now frozen by a special kind of cryogenic ice that rendered them unable to move until Sector 5 deactivated at the end of the hour. Caesar mentioned that they had not seen this last time, but he also asked if Paddock was sure that these tributes would not die from the cold, to which she replied that the monkeys that this ice had been tested on were all fine, but this would not stop other tributes from walking along the beach and maybe taking aim at them with their weapons. Indeed, as the hour went by, the cameras of the sector focused on the eyes of each of the three tributes, and as Cure appeared to spot Duncan Peroni and Broder Bernhardt, both from Nine, walking along the beach in front of them, the terror in her eyes was extremely apparent. Luckily for Cure, this pair failed to notice her, and they continued bickering about whose turn it was to hold their spear. However, towards the end of this antagonising hour, the eyeballs of the three tributes were seen to follow the sound of footsteps that was coming through Sector 4, along the edge of the frosty area. Unfortunately for them, they were not able to properly move their heads and see who this was walking past them, but viewers saw that this was Pixel, who had come back from the depths of Sector 4, after finally appearing to realise that she had been tricked by the Jabberjays. Pixel looked deeply perplexed by the frozen bodies of her friends, and seemed to be looking up, possibly for the hovercraft. She headed around to the beach and shouted Cure and Phoenix names at them, but they were unable to move. Yet just as she was trying to assure them, she looked to her left and screamed. Link Larson from Five was running across the beach towards Pixel, who had just spotted him. She shot a glance at Cure and Finnick before seeming to realise that if Link attacked her, he would also be able to attack Cure and Finnick shortly afterwards. Pixel panicked, but then ran across the beach and into the jungle of Sector 6. As Link ran past Sector 5 and after Pixel, he seemed to not notice the frozen tributes, and just as he entered Sector 6's jungle, the frost appeared to melt from the ends of Cure's fingers, and she found much to her relief that she was able to start moving them as well. Meanwhile, in Sector 6, Pixel had quickly hidden in a bush just metres into the jungle, and Link ran straight past her. As Pixel watched him continually running away, she ran back out of the jungle and across the beach to where her allies were gradually unfreezing. Pixel watched with joy as she saw Cure's face return to its normal colour. Cure let out a quiet shriek, before stating that this was the most horrible experience of her life so far. 
After a minute, Cure's legs finally unfroze, and Pixel helped her walk out of the jungle, just as Finnick's hands started moving as well. Once Finnick was unfrozen, he immediately waved his arms around and stated how nice it was to move again, before making his way back to the beach. Remedio, who had rather badly injured his knee, stumbled through the jungle. He instantly sat down on the sunlit beach and said that he would never complain about being sunburnt again. Although the three frozen tributes were clearly pleased to be able to move once again, they still seemed rather shaken, with Cure suddenly crying after a few minutes before tearfully thanking Pixel for distracting Link. A few minutes later, whilst they were drinking some of their water, a cannon was heard, and this was revealed to belong to Link, when he was found and ripped apart by the Monster Mart in Sector 6. As the group watched the hovercraft retrieving the parts of Link's body, Pixel nodded and grinned as she said TikTok to herself. The others asked Pixel what she meant, and she replied that the hazards were flowing through each of the sectors of the arena, like a hand through a clock. She continued that they had rather stupidly just spent the night following the hazards, before saying that BT was right. The others asked her what this meant, but she refused to say any more. However, it soon became clear to them that Pixel was correct about the design of the arena. Remedio yawned and said that they needed to sleep somewhere. Finnick asked Pixel if Sector 5, which had just frozen them, would now be safe, to which Pixel nodded and said that it would be for the next 11 hours. The group therefore spent about 40 minutes heading through this sector until they were close to the perimeter. Once they were happy with their location, Finnick agreed to keep watch for the first two hours so that the others could sleep properly. They proceeded to take turns sleeping and keeping watch, with only one cannon sounding over the next few hours, which was revealed to belong to Salem Cast from Six, when he was hit by the tsunami of Sector 10. By the early afternoon, they had all slept to an adequate extent, and just as they were starting to eat, Finnick stated that he had a plan to kill more of the careers. The others asked Finnick what he was thinking, and he stated that they could try to lure some of the career tributes into Sector 4, then once the hour had ended, they may be able to kill these tributes, as they would probably be in a state of shock from listening to the Jabberjays for the last hour. Although the others were slow to accept this plan, they realised that they did not have any alternative ideas, and so they agreed to listen to Finnick's plan. The group rested at the edge of Sector 5, next to the beach in Sector 4. When they heard the cries of Baby Button, Annie Cresta, and various members of the Covey, Finnick asked if everyone knew what they needed to do, to which they each nodded. Remedio and Cure then walked onto the beach and proceeded to have an argument with each other, whilst Finnick and Pixel carefully looked out for any movement within the jungle of the other sectors. Both Remedio and Cure acted surprisingly well, with Veronica from Five even laughing whilst watching this argument from up a tree in the jungle of Sector 1. However, when Rucius and Charmer appeared at the edge of Sector 12's jungle, Finnick and Pixel shouted at Remedio and Cure, to start running into the jungle of Sector 4, just as Rucius and Charmer emerged from the jungle with their spears at the ready. Shortly after running into the jungle, Remedio and Cure hid under an overgrown tree that they had already selected for shelter, and when Rucius and Charmer entered the jungle, they sprinted past Remedio and Cure, and instead seemed to chase after the screams of the Jabberjays. However, when Rucius began to hear his little brother shouting for help, and Charmer listened to his mother's screams, they appeared scared and confused, and shouted out for these members of their families. The hour went by, and when the sound of the Jabberjays finally ended, Finnick and Pixel quickly found Remedio and Cure. Finnick gave Remedio the spear, before asking him which way Rucius and Charmer had gone. As the boys ran off in the direction that Remedio said, Pixel looked after Cure, and took her back to the beach for some fresh air. Within a minute of running, the boys found Charmer, who was covered in black feathers and cowering on the ground. Finnick immediately ran towards Charmer, who looked up, but before he could even grab his weapon, Finnick had stabbed the trident through his head and a cannon sounded. Remedio even thought that he could hear Rucius running away in the distance, and he ran in this direction, but to no avail. Unbeknownst to Remedio, Rucius had actually withstood the mental language of the Jabberjays rather well, possibly due to his training at the academy, and he therefore ran into Sector 3 as soon as the hour had ended. The boys returned to the beach and saw Charmer's body being retrieved by the hovercraft. Pixel quickly stated that she did not want to stay on the beach, as she felt vulnerable in this location, but at the same time, she did not want to head into the jungle, due to the hazards and opaque forests. Finnick gestured towards the central island, and stated that it was the only place that matched her preferences. Although Pixel was a little worried about being in the centre of the arena, Cure pointed out that it was actually rather advantageous, as they would be able to see other tributes coming from in the distance. The group therefore made their way to this island, and as the sun set, 
They rested within the cornucopia itself and ate some food. When Sector 8 was activated, they heard a cannon, which was shown to viewers to belong to Broder Bernhardt from Nine, when Duncan Peroni, also from Nine, became annoyed by the mosquitoes that were biting them, and when Broder continued to moan about the bites that she was receiving, Duncan lost his patience with Broder and stabbed her through the head. However, Duncan then walked into Sector 9, and within minutes of the Sector activating, he had been mauled to death by a particularly violent lion. Duncan's cannon sounded, but just as his body was being taken by the hovercraft, another cannon sounded, which confused the group, but was shown to be that of Veronica von Altagot from 5, when she walked away from the sounds of the lions into Sector 12, through the darkness, and straight into the lair of Chiffon and Rusius, who had seen her coming. Although Veronica tried to run once she spotted them, it was too late for her to escape, and they quickly stabbed her to death. Finnick, Pixel, Cure, and Remedio continued to rest on the central island, and they tried to figure out who was still alive apart from them. That night, the portraits of Charma Bocelli from 1, Herminia Monto from 2, Adelaide McCain from 4, Link Larson and Veronica von Altagot, both from 5, Salem Cast from 6, Duncan Peroni and Broder Bernhardt, both from 9, Bradford Farnham from 10, and Dylan Mitchell and Calla Prime, both from 11, were all shown in the sky. At a total of 11 tributes, this was the single biggest daily death toll since the reclamation, and apart from the group of four on the central island, only Chiffon, Rusius, and Vermont Didsbury from six were still alive. The group took turns keeping watch and sleeping through the night. Despite several false alarms that someone was approaching them, the other tributes remained where they had been and made no attempts to approach this group. By the time the sun rose, all the tributes had awoken, and the Central Island group ate and drank, whilst looking out to try and see any other tributes. Remedio sat down with Cure on a side of the island, and he said to her that he felt like he had seen this lake before. Cure replied that it looked like the lake near District 12. Remedio agreed, but much to the confusion of capital viewers, he proceeded to joke that unlike the lake back home, skeletons would have no time to form by this lake, as a body would be removed as soon as its owner was dead. It was unknown if Remedio was referring to some kind of code, but Finnick then asked him to take the other side of the island with Pixel, and it is believed that he did this as he wanted to talk to Cure in a more intimate setting. Yet during this period of relative peace, Caesar went live to the control room, where Game Maker Paddock announced that she wanted to cause one final episode of action. Caesar sounded curious about what this would entail, and the central island started moving slowly in an anti-clockwise direction. Finnick, who had just sat down to talk to Cure, quickly stood up and asked what was happening. Cure appeared to be quite scared, but as the movement started to increase, Finnick called to Pixel and Remedio to hold on. Although they almost tripped when the island started moving, they both managed to grab onto the side of the cornucopia, whilst Finnick lay down and thrust his trident into the crevices of the rocks, before grabbing Cure's hand and holding her tightly against him. The speed of the island's rotation continued to rise to what would normally be considered a dangerous level. Although Pixel and Remedio had gripped on tightly to the side of the cornucopia, they fell backwards within 30 seconds. Pixel knocked her elbow rather painfully as she tumbled down the rock, but once she fell into the water, she only spent a few seconds beneath the surface, before emerging and gasping out for breath, then grabbing onto the nearest spoke as the island continued spinning. Remedio, who had managed to hold on a little longer, fell back shortly after Pixel. Yet instead of hitting the water like she had, his body bounced straight against one of the spokes and his head was hit with such force that he was immediately killed by this impact. As Remedio's body came to the surface of the water, his cannon sounded, and Cure, who was still being held by Finnick, shouted for Remedio. The island continued spinning, and Cure appeared to be trying to see whose cannon had sounded, but Finnick yelled at her to hold on. Paddock decided to end the island spin, and as Finnick and Cure quickly attempted to regain their sense of balance, Cure shouted out for Remedio to help her, yet Finnick looked over and saw Remedio's lifeless body in the water before him. Pixel climbed onto the island and ran towards her allies, but when Cure saw her, she shouted for Remedio. Finnick told her that they needed to get off this island, and as Cure spotted Remedio's body, she screamed out and shouted his name. Cure tried to run towards the hovercraft that was about to retrieve Remedio's body, but Finnick restrained her and told her that there was nothing they could do for him. At that moment, Pixel saw Chiffon and Rusius running across the beach from Sector 12, and she tugged on Finnick's arm in order to alert him. When Finnick saw that they were being approached, he grabbed Cure by the arm. She continued to shout for Remedio, 
but Finnick told Cure that he would not want them to die like this. As Cure looked over at Chiffon and Rusius, who had just started running across his boat towards them, she finally started running, and the trio sprinted across one of the opposite spokes towards Sector 7. They subsequently sprinted together through Sector 7, and were quickly followed by Chiffon and Rusius. After they had been running for almost a minute, Game Maker Paddock announced that, with five out of the six of them in the jungle, let's have some fun. She then set the hazards in all twelve sectors to occur simultaneously, which, as expected, caused a chaotic plethora of different noises, ranging from a diverse weather to excited animal noises. All the tributes except for Vermont were now in Sector 7, where the hazard was a controlled leak of a gas that could temporarily paralyse tribute's legs. As Paddock explained this to Caesar, the live footage of the game showed Rusius and Chiffon catching up with Pixel, who had not managed to run as quickly as Finney could cure. Of the five tributes in this sector, Pixel's legs gave way first and she suddenly stumbled to the ground whilst Cure and Finnick ran forwards. Yet just as Rusius was about to tackle Pixel, who was visibly panicking at not being able to move her legs, both Cure and Chiffon screamed almost simultaneously as their legs seemed to give way as well. Finnick ran back to help Cure, who was now pushing herself across the ground towards him, but just as Finnick was about to help her up, his left leg collapsed on its side and he fell into a bush. He proceeded to watch Rusius stab Pixel in the stomach. She gasped in pain, and Rusius averted his gaze to Cure, who was now lying helplessly close to Rusius. Rusius grabbed his knife from Pixel's stomach, which made her scream out once more, but just as he tried to get back up to his feet, Pixel somehow mustered the strength to grab Rusius' foot, which made him topple over onto his chest, and almost immediately a cannon sounded. Many viewers, and even Caesar, appeared to think that this cannon belonged to Pixel, but as she let out a weak grin, it appeared that she was still alive, and that this cannon had in fact belonged to Rusius, who had accidentally fallen on his own knife, due to Pixel's intervention. Chiffon had been discreetly watching this scene from behind a bush, but after seeing Rusius inadvertently stab himself, she used all the strength in her arms to pull herself along the ground, in the direction of Sector 6, whilst Cure and Fennec dragged themselves back to where Pixel lay dying. Cure cried as Pixel's breathing slowed, but Fennec stressed to her that they needed to get out of this sector. Cure panicked a bit more, but Pixel mouthed at Cure to go, before her movement ceased and her cannon sounded. Finnick then helped Cure to drag herself away from Pixel, and as her and Rusius' bodies were lifted by the hovercraft, Finnick and Cure continued to practically crawl across Sector 7. They became extremely muddy during this time, and Cure shouted out that she could not continue, but Finnick pulled her onwards, and after a few arduous minutes, they started to sense the feeling returning to their legs as they entered Sector 8. They got up as quickly as they could, but just as Phoenix signalled the way to the beach, he was quickly bitten by a rather large swarm of mosquitoes. As Phoenix tried to swat them away, Cure watched on in horror, and shouted out that this had to be some kind of joke. She then asserted that they needed to head to the beach, and Phoenix agreed. As they ran, he shouted that this must be the end game. The pair ran onwards, and although they were bitten by a few mosquitoes, they were not too badly injured. After two minutes of running, they made it out of the jungle and onto the beach. Finnick carefully looked around the beach as Cure ran straight forward into the lake and seemed to try to use the water to soothe the mosquito bites that she had just received. Yet just as Cure shouted at Finnick to come into the water with her, he looked over and saw someone emerge from the water behind Cure. Finnick shouted at Cure, but it was too late, and before she could even turn around, Vermont smashed one of the rocks onto Cure's head. The force of this rock was so strong that Cure's cannon sounded immediately. Finnick grabbed his trident and ran across the sand towards Vermont, but she quickly submerged herself under the water, which Finnick was unable to see through. He waited on the edge of the water, ready to throw the spear at Vermont as soon as she appeared from the water. A minute went by as Finnick's eyes darted over the water, looking for any sign of someone moving beneath it. He seemed to be trying to avoid looking at Cure's body that was still floating in the water, but Finnick soon seemed to notice that the body was slowly floating towards him despite there being no wind or current within the water. Viewers could see that Vermont had dipped her head just above Cure's body, which she was using to hide behind. Finnick carefully waded sideways through the water, and when he finally managed to spot Vermont, she tried to submerge herself against the water once again, but Finnick threw the trident immediately at her head, and as it hit her skull, her cannon sounded. During this altercation, Finnick had seemingly failed to notice the sounds of the monster mutt that had been chasing Chiffon through Sector 6, but after several narrow escapes from the mutt swipes, Chiffon made it out in one piece, and she collapsed onto the beach, just as Finnick retrieved his trident 
and waded back out of the water. He then ran towards Chiffon, but she quickly armed herself with her one remaining arrow, and Finnick quickly stopped himself from approaching her any further. As Game Maker Paddock terminated all twelve hazards, Finnick and Chiffon stood on the sand, just metres away from each other, with their weapons at the ready. After a tense few seconds of silence, both in the arena and in Snow Square, the pair very slowly started circling each other, carefully alternating their vision between their opponent's weapons and eyes. Chiffon suddenly pushed herself on her feet towards Finnick, but he hardly flinched like she had probably expected him to. However, Finnick then pretended to throw his trident towards Chiffon's heart, but he held onto it at the last minute, which made her flinch. She subsequently fired her arrow at Finnick, but he managed to duck in time, and it only hit him in the shoulder. Although Finnick shouted out with pain, Chiffon was now unarmed. She let out a quiet, panicked scream and started to run, but Finnick chased after her, and within seconds, he had caught up with her. Chiffon then tried to push Finnick away, but he knocked her to the floor with his trident before slamming it down through her heart. Finnick apologised to Chiffon, and within a few seconds, her cannon sounded. He removed his trident from her chest, and then walked quietly to the water, before sitting down at the edge and staring at the central island. Eugenia announced that Finnick Jr. O'Dare was the winner of the 80th Hunger Games, and the hovercraft came down to remove him from the arena. Following his victory, Finnick Jr. proved to be a very popular victor amongst both the capital and the districts. During the victor's interview, he was compared to his father, yet when he mentioned that he would not have been able to win without his allies, Caesar quipped that he must have inherited his modesty from his mother. Game Maker Paddock also had a final interview, and she rightfully received a standing ovation from the audience upon entering the stage. She stated that it had been a pleasure to have brought such a high level of entertainment to the capital but that she would never completely rule out returning. Now that she was retiring, however, she planned to spend a long holiday in Scotland in order to see it with her own eyes. After his victory tour, Finnick stayed in the capital and his attendance was often requested for many social gatherings that were hosted by the cream of the capital. Yet although Finnick received many romantic offers from citizens of the capital, he became enamoured with one of his old school friends, Corel Flunt, when he returned to District 4 the next summer. A few years later, he married her, and they went on to have a daughter, Mags. So thank you once again for watching everyone, I hope you enjoyed. Feel free to leave your opinions, thoughts, theories, what have you, down in the comments. Also, I'm doing a Q&A in the next video, as I already mentioned. And I'm going to be doing 12 questions and giving the answers to them. I'm going to be doing six that are based on Tales of the Hunger Games, based on this series. I'm going to be doing three that are based on the Hunger Games in general, and three that are based on anything else that can be a question about me, about politics, about what's going on in the world, whatever you want. If you'd like to leave them in reply to the pinned comment below, I will look from there and I will select 12 that will be answered at the end of the next video. I'd also like to give a massive shout out to Andrew McLean once again for all the art that was included. We had quite a bit of fun coming up with President Gould's physical description this week, so it might include something like this in the future, but we'll see. And I'd also like to thank my patrons very much for your support. And also feel free to check the links in the description that are linked to this series. Next week there will not be any games, but next Monday, November the 9th, there will be. I hope that you'll have a great two weeks, and I will see you then. Toodles.